Welcome to the Medical City Transplant Program. I'm Dr. Matthew Malloy, the Surgical Director of the Adult and Pediatric Transplant Program. We thank you for choosing Medical City for your transplant evaluation today. We understand you may have some nervousness or anxiety about coming here today, and that many people haven't slept the night before their transplant evaluation. We want to make sure you have all the information you need to answer all your questions, and that you have an opportunity to meet the warm and caring group of people who are going to be taking care of you today. Exploring kidney transplantation is important for many reasons. Most importantly, it is the preferred form of treatment for kidney failure, with improved survival and quality of life compared to remaining on dialysis. However, there are some risks associated with the transplant surgery and from the medications you take to suppress your immune system following transplant. You will learn more about these today. The evaluation you will undergo today will help you determine if kidney transplantation is the best treatment option for you. Some of the reasons a transplant may not be an option are severe disease of the heart, the blood vessels, or the liver, active cancer, with the exception of skin cancers. So for example, if you've had a recent prostate removal for prostate cancer or a recent breast cancer treatment, there may be a wait of between two and five years before you can become a transplant candidate. Many times, you'll be able to accrue time on the waiting list while these time periods elapse. An active infection, for example, if you have a foot ulcer that needs to heal, that is something that could be treated, and then the patient could have a transplant once that ulcer is healed. Severe obesity. In general, a BMI of greater than 40 could prevent you from being on the transplant waiting list. Inability to adhere to treatment plans like prescribed medications, dialysis treatments, and appointments. Any unstable psychiatric conditions. And other safety or health concerns. The transplant evaluation process consists of several steps. The first is making this appointment today. Medical tests you may have today. Evaluation by the transplant physicians, social workers, pharmacists, dietitian, and possibly others such as a surgeon. Your report will be given to the transplant selection committee. The committee recommendation will be sent to you and your referring physician. During your evaluation, you will have several medical tests done. A blood test, an EKG, a chest x-ray, and an abdominal ultrasound or CT scan. The evaluations are individualized for each candidate's medical history, so you may have other additional tests at a future date. These could include pulmonary function tests, cardiovascular tests, such as a stress test or echocardiogram for your heart, or a liver test or evaluation by a liver specialist. Following your comprehensive visit today, the results of your test and evaluations will be reviewed at Transplant Selection Committee, where we will go over the recommendations and notify you in writing and also notify your referring physician. Hi, I'm Diana Greenland, Supervisor for the Transplant Social Work Department here at Medical City Dallas Hospital. I'm here today to talk about the psychosocial assessment. The transplant social worker will complete a comprehensive psychosocial evaluation on every patient referred for transplant to determine if they meet the psychosocial criteria. The psychosocial evaluation includes the following, social, personal, housing, vocational, financial, and environmental support and strengths. Cultural and language factors, identified and confirmed post-transplant caregivers, financial issues which could interfere with post-transplant medication compliance, post-transplant medication plan, coping abilities and strategies, understanding the risks and benefits of transplantation, the ability to adhere to the post-transplant process, and mental health history including substance abuse, tobacco, alcohol use, and or abuse, and how it may impact the success or failure of organ transplantation. There are several psychosocial factors known to contribute to poor patient graft outcomes. They include poor social support and or absence of family caregivers, mental health or psychiatric disorders likely to negatively impact post-transplant compliance, self-destructive behaviors such as alcohol, tobacco, or substance abuse, a history of poor compliance with medical and mental health treatment, the patient's inability or unwillingness to understand the need for improved compliance. 
dysfunctional personality traits and disorders, and financial concerns, which could interfere with the post-transplant medication compliance. The social worker will meet with the other transplant team members to review and discuss the psychosocial evaluation. The transplant committee will formally determine if the patient is a suitable transplant candidate and should be listed for transplant. Your social worker is involved with you throughout your transplant evaluation, including pre-transplant evaluation, transplant selection, and hospital discharge planning. The social worker also provides information and referral to community resources. Hi, I am Donna Voisart, Supervisor for the Kidney Pancreas Transplant Program here at Medical City. During your evaluation today, you will have the opportunity to meet your coordinator if you have not already, and we will give you their contact information before you leave here today. Your pre-transplant coordinator will put all of your testing together in a report and present it to the Transplant Selection Committee, where we will determine if you are a candidate, if you need more testing, or if you are not a candidate. After this, you will get a call from your coordinator telling you the results of the selection committee. You, your nephrologist, and your dialysis center, if you are on dialysis, will also get a letter regarding the results of your evaluation and whether or not you are moving forward to transplant. Once you are approved by the committee, the final insurance approval is required before you can be added to the kidney transplant waiting list. This can take up to 30 days. However, if you have a living donor, once your coordinator has informed you that you have been accepted, that living donor can begin the process of being evaluated. Once you receive the final approval for transplant, you will be placed on the UNOS transplant waiting list. UNOS stands for United Network for Organ Sharing. You will be notified within 10 days of listing. You have the right to refuse a transplant at any time. If you have any concerns about the transplant list process, contact UNOS at 888-894-6361 or visit their website at unos.org. What should you do if you are placed on the waiting list? You should let us know of any changes in your health, heart problems, infections, cancers, and hospitalizations. We need to know about any changes. You will come back every year for testing and see the transplant team if you are still waiting for a transplant. You will need to adhere to your dialysis schedule, treatment plans, appointments, and medications prescribed to you by your medical provider. Send us monthly blood work so we can test any kidney offer for matching. If we don't have updated blood information stored in the lab, you could miss an offer. You will make sure you can always, always, always be reached and that we have updated contact numbers for you. Skipping any of these items could keep you from receiving a transplant. The amount of time a patient waits on the transplant list varies according to your blood type. Patients with blood type O typically wait four to five years or longer. A blood type is a three to four year wait. B blood type is five years or longer and AB blood type is one to two years. Potential recipients of a kidney or kidney pancreas transplant are placed on a wait list according to three main factors, their blood type, their tissue type, and their panel reactive antibodies, or PRA. Deceased donors are registered with the UNOS by the local organ bank. Donors and recipients are matched by a computer based on blood type, tissue type, time on the list, and PRA levels. The organ that becomes available is offered on the local, regional, the national level to the person on the waiting list who has the most matching points. Information about you is entered into the system, including your age, your length of time on dialysis, if you have had a previous transplant, and if you have diabetes. Each potential deceased donor that becomes available will be classified with a Kidney Donor Profile Index, or KDPI score. This score is determined based on age, height, weight, and ethnicity, whether the donor died due to a loss of heart function or brain function, stroke as a cause of death, history of high blood pressure, history of diabetes, exposure to the hepatitis C virus, and their serum creatinine level. The donor to recipient matching is done by the UNOS computer system. 
Candidates who are expected to need a kidney for the longest time will be matched more often with kidneys that will have the longest expected function. People who are hard to match due to antibodies or blood type will get additional priority. Donor kidneys with a KDPI score greater than 85% are likely to function the shortest time. These kidneys will be offered only to candidates who have given written consent in advance that they are willing to accept a kidney with this score. There are several additional options available to most transplant candidates. Multiple listings, Candidates have the option to be listed at multiple transplant centers. You probably won't benefit from listing at multiple centers in the same organ procurement organization, or OPO, but it isn't against UNOS policy if you want to. You should know that there are three OPOs in Texas. Donors with a high Kidney Donor Profile Index, or KDPI, Living Donors, and Paired Donor Exchange. A kidney donor profile index, or KDPI, is used to predict kidney graft outcomes and is also an alternative measure of expanded criteria for donors. There are several potential advantages to accepting this type of donor. You will likely experience shorter waiting times, the ability to improve survival, especially in people who have increased risk health by staying on dialysis for prolonged time, we usually evaluate any recipient over the age of 50 for this option. Recipients with diabetes may benefit from accepting a high KDPI kidney as well. Recipients with cardiovascular problems may benefit. Recipients who have difficulty maintaining an access for dialysis may also benefit. There are potential disadvantages of accepting a high KDPI kidney. The transplant may not work. The transplant may not work as well or last as long. You may need dialysis for a while after the transplant. You may have to stay in the hospital longer after your transplant. Here is some other information about donors with high KDPI. You will be told if you are being offered a high KDPI kidney. You do not have to accept a high KDPI kidney. If you are willing to accept a kidney with high KDPI, you must sign a consent form prior to being listed. Accepting a high KDPI kidney may mean you get transplanted sooner and or you are off dialysis sooner. If you are considering accepting this type of donor, your transplant doctor and your coordinator will give you information and help you in making that decision. I'm Dr. Matthew Malloy, and I'm the Surgical Director of the Adult and Pediatric Transplant Program at Medical City, and I'd like to talk about living kidney donation. One of the first things that people ask is, does it matter if someone is related or unrelated? And that is what I'd like to discuss over the next few minutes. Essentially, the answer is no. A living donor is going to be superior to any deceased donor you receive. I often get asked who's a good candidate for living donation and essentially anyone over the age of 18 is potentially a candidate with a few exceptions. The main thing we worry about is making sure the living donor is safe. We don't want to put them at risk of having kidney disease later down the road. There are four important contraindications that we look at. If the potential donor is morbidly obese, meaning if their BMI is over 30. If they have diabetes or if they have hypertension, they cannot donate a kidney because we know that these are things that could cause trouble down the road. If the donor has an infection that could be easily transmitted, such as hepatitis or HIV, they are also not an appropriate candidate. There are several advantages to having a living donor, the first of which is decreased waiting time. The main problem we have with kidney transplantation basically everywhere in the country is the prolonged waiting time for deceased donor kidneys. On average right now, the waiting time for a kidney transplant is about four to five years. With a living donor, of course, you don't have that problem because as long as we have a donor, it can be done whenever everyone is ready. In addition, we know that the graft function overall is better with a living donor. On average, a living donor kidney lasts about twice as long as a deceased donor. Also, there is the advantage of being an elective procedure. So most of the time when you come in for a deceased donor kidney, it often happens in the middle of the night at a very inconvenient time for everyone. On the other hand, with a living donor kidney, it is a planned procedure so they can make sure that both the recipient and the donor are healthy and in good shape at the time we do the transplant. 
We also know that any living donor kidney is better than the best match deceased donor kidney. In addition, older living donors are as good as young deceased donors, so age is not as much of a consideration for a living donor. Also, women of childbearing age are candidates to donate a kidney as long as their child is already over a year of age. If it is a woman who's considering childbirth in the future, we suggest that they wait at least a year before conceiving. Medical City actually has several programs designed to increase the chances of receiving a transplant. Essentially what happens, even when someone steps up with a potential living donor, actually only 30 to 40% of those folks are compatible. Now, because of two things, particularly paired exchange transplantation and desensitization programs, we're able to find appropriate living donors for these difficult to match recipients. Our desensitization program is there to allow transplantation of recipients who have antibodies against their donors. So even if they have a compatible kidney match, sometimes they have antibodies that prevent them from being transplanted. So this is where desensitization comes in. We have certain protocols and medications that we give to the recipients to try to remove these antibodies to allow transplantation to occur. I would like to talk about our paired exchange program, which is a very important program with living donors here at Medical City. We find donors and recipients across the country and we swap kidneys, which I will explain a little bit later on. The importance is that this is the fastest growing source of transplantable kidneys over the last 10 years. If you look back 10 years ago, hardly anyone was doing paired exchange, but now over 400 kidney transplants a year across the country are due to paired exchange transplantation. The main issue with living donation is even though someone steps up as a potential donor, only about a third to 40% are compatible. The best way to explain how paired exchange works is with an example. For example, if a recipient is a blood type B, they can normally only receive a kidney from someone with another blood type B or blood type O. But for example, one of their loved ones steps up with a blood type A. Normally they wouldn't be able to donate a kidney. So what we do in this situation is we look across the country. We work with about 130 centers across the United States, and we find another pair who's in the opposite situation. For example, a blood type A recipient with a type B donor, and then we swap those donors. Now that blood type B donor from the second pair can donate to the first recipient and vice versa. By doing this, it accomplishes a couple of things. It allows both of those recipients to get off the waiting list, and also we're able to improve their outcomes because they now have living donor kidneys, which are expected to last twice as long as a deceased donor kidney. A variant of paired exchange transplantation is a domino chain transplant, which is very interesting because it's predicated on having an altruistic donor. This is a person who's willing to donate a kidney to anyone just out of the goodness of their heart, but they don't have a specific recipient associated with them. They approach our center or one of the paired exchange programs and say, I'd like to donate my kidney to somebody. And we find the best possible match for them and then start creating a chain of transplants. For example, you could possibly have a donor who steps up and says, I want to donate to somebody. Normally what would happen in the past is that that donor would give to somebody on the deceased donor waiting list, but it's not really the most efficient use of that organ. By putting them into a paired exchange, Essentially what happens is you have two pairs of patients. This altruistic donor will donate to the recipient of the first pair, and once that person receives their kidney, their donor is now free to donate to the next person, which can then happen. That donor then donates to the recipient of pair number two, and then the donor of pair number two can donate to the next person, and so on and so on. As you can see, the potential of this is that it can go on forever as long as there are enough donors available afterwards. Donor and recipient surgeries are generally performed at the same time. There are essentially three ways to take out a donor's kidney. We do it robotically, laparoscopically, and a very small percentage have to be done open in, a, in the traditional fashion due to a number of patient factors. A big advantage of the laparoscopic surgery compared to the old open surgery is the size of the incision and the recovery time. In the past, when we had to do open surgery, it required a big incision in the flank and often three or four days in the hospital and quite a long recovery time at home with a significant amount of pain. The laparoscopic surgery consists of one three inch incision to remove the kidney and maybe two or possibly three one inch incisions for the camera and instruments. 
Surgery on the donor usually takes anywhere from two to four hours. The usual expected postoperative stay is 24 to 48 hours. The only restriction they have once home is really no heavy lifting for about six weeks. They can walk, they can take the stairs, they can go on with their normal daily activities, but no heavy lifting like boxes, for example, or sit-ups or sports for about six weeks. And then after about six weeks, they can do anything they want. There are no more specific restrictions. Donors will not need to be on long-term medications after donation. When you are being considered to be a kidney recipient, it is always good, a good idea to talk to your friends and family about potentially being a donor. Unfortunately, our transplant program cannot contact them and they have to call us themselves and do it voluntarily. If you think you have a potential donor, have your donors contact your pre-transplant coordinator. The coordinator will then screen the donor and verify ABO compatibility. Potential donors will be cross-matched with the recipient and typed. The best matched potential donor will come in for a donor evaluation. The donor goes through a workup with many medical tests to ensure donor and recipient safety. All donor information is confidential and cannot be discussed with the transplant recipient. All charges for the donor evaluation and surgery are covered by the recipient's insurance. Hello, I am Dr. Mark Lerman, Medical Director of the Kidney Transplant Program. I know it is difficult for many potential recipients to approach someone and ask them to donate a kidney. So I advise people that when you're asking them to donate a kidney, you first need to be comfortable disclosing the fact that you have kidney disease and that you need a transplant. You may be on dialysis or about to start dialysis. And when talking with a potential donor, you can say, I was at the transplant center at Medical City and I spoke with Dr. Lerman and he really encouraged me to try to find someone to donate a kidney to me. Finding a potential donor is a great option since it shortens the waiting time and the results are usually better or superior to those of a deceased donor kidney. At that point, the person you're talking to is either going to say, good luck, I hope you find someone, or they may start expressing an interest and ask more questions. It is really key to make sure that you give them information and that you educate them. Specifically, you can let them know that living donation is safe and the risk of complications with this surgery is very low and it's minimally invasive because it is now done laparoscopically. Also let them know that the potential recipient's insurance will pay for the donor's evaluation, the donor's surgery, and the donor's post-operative care. Within four to six weeks, living donors are back to doing everything they did before they donated a kidney. Those are the educational points I encourage you to tell potential donors. If you do not have a living donor and you're waiting for a kidney from the list, it is very important to stay in close contact with your pre-transplant coordinator so you can be easily contacted when a donor organ becomes available. When a donor organ becomes available for you, a number of things will happen. The transplant coordinator will contact you. You usually have about six to 12 hours of advance notice to get to the hospital. You will go to Medical City Dallas Hospital. When you get there, you will have some blood work, a chest x-ray, and an EKG, and be evaluated by the surgeon and nephrologist. You will be asked to sign consents at that time. Your surgery will be a go if the results of your cross-match are negative and the rest of the preoperative evaluation is normal. The incision for your kidney transplant is usually in the right lower quadrant. Sometimes we will go on the left side if there is a particular reason, but generally we like to use the right side because it is easier to reach the blood vessels. Your native kidneys will not be removed at the time of transplant. Occasionally prior to being listed, one or both native kidneys may need to be removed if they are very large or chronically infected or there is any possibility of a malignancy. After the surgery, which will take anywhere from two to four hours, you will go to the ICU to be monitored very closely. Typically, the post-operative stay is three to four days. After the transplant, you will have several lines in place. You will have a catheter in your bladder, which stays for two days, as well as a large IV, either near your chest or in the neck, which stays for two to three days and is there for medications and fluids. 
You have to be careful afterwards about following instructions. And the most important thing after a transplant is to get up and walk as much as possible. One of the main risks after any surgery is the development of blood clots. So the sooner you walk and ambulate, the less the chances are you will develop blood clots in the legs as well as any lung problems. The post-operative stay after a kidney transplant is usually three to four days. It is very important to follow your doctor's orders. Get out of bed and walk and learn what you need to do after discharge. The most important thing is understanding medications, which our coordinators will go over with you post-operatively before you go home. Also note that no children under the age of 12 or live plants are allowed in your room because of potential infectious diseases. After a kidney transplant, patients often notice changes right away. The new kidney will often make urine immediately, although it's possible if the kidney does come from a deceased donor, it may take a few days to a couple of weeks before they start working, and this is called delayed graft function. This can happen in a situation where the kidney was on ice for a longer period of time, or it was a kidney from an older donor, in which case, about 30% of the time, it will take that long before they start to function. Rest assured, the vast majority of these kidneys do function. They just take a little time. And if they don't function right away, you may need dialysis treatments temporarily until the new kidney begins to work. At the end of the day, there is no guarantee that any kidney will work. However, given the data that we have, we know that one year after transplant, especially for a living donor kidney, about 99% of these kidneys are functioning appropriately. And for deceased donor kidneys, it is somewhere between 94 to 95% that are functioning appropriately. Hi, I'm Brandon Mullins. I'm one of the transplant coordinators, and I'd like to give you an idea of what to expect when you're discharged home from your new transplant. You will not be on your own, and our team will continue to be available to you to guide you through this process. First, let me tell you about your medications. You will usually have three different medications to prevent rejection. Each one works on a different part of your immune system. Anti-rejection medications can be very expensive and have side effects. You may also go home with several other medications depending on what you need. Many patients and their families do fundraising if necessary to help with the costly expenses of transplant medications. You must take these medications for the rest of your life in order to prevent the rejection of your kidney. When you are first discharged after your transplant, you will come back to the clinic several times per week for the first few weeks. There are several reasons that you will need to return to the clinic. To monitor your kidney function and drug levels, to look for side effects of your medications, to check your clinical and psychological status, to adjust your blood pressure and diabetes therapy if you are diabetic, and to answer your questions. Your clinic visits will become less frequent as time goes on and as you are feeling better. And as I mentioned, the transplant team is here for you. All of our surgeons, nephrologists, transplant coordinators, and other specialties will be available to you 24 seven. We are required to submit data to UNOS at periodic intervals, indicating how you and your kidney are doing. The results of this data can be found at www.srtr.org. This website will also show our transplant center patient outcomes. And remember, we are your transplant team, but you as the patient are the driver of your transplant experience. We realize that many of you have come from far away and have put a lot of effort into this appointment and it is very important to your future health and your current health. We really look forward to getting you through this process, hopefully allowing you to be placed on the transplant waiting list and to achieve the ultimate goal of receiving your kidney or pancreas transplant. Thank you so much for coming.